group focuses mainly on asylum and refugees in the Middle East, which are focused on migration and transnational practices with the Palestinian diaspora. He is currently conducting research on Syrian and Palestinian refugees from Syria in Jordan and in Lebanon, as well as on the urbanization uh, process of Palestinian refugee camps um, in Lebanon. So he develops comparative studies between refugees residing in and out of camps, as well as analysis of their migratory experience and special practices to map the relationships between refugee camps and uh, their urban environment in the Middle East. Yes, so uh, you're a geographer, and of course, uh, you know, that's really interesting, you know, urban refugees uh, and those uh, living in the camps, those not living in the camps. Uh, and then there's how they use their space uh, within the city, within the camp. Uh, and that was really interesting. One very interesting thing when I visited Beirut was the Shatila camp, of course. Not the, when we say camp, of course, it's really understood as, a, you know, like, I don't know, some tent, some uh, make up uh you know houses perhaps uh but of course it's not like uh, well that's true but it's also true that um um it's it becomes like a whole a big neighborhood <laughs> uh so uh so anyway without further ado and then it's a comparative study uh i will give you the floor and the palestinian refugees has been there of course uh in the middle east for many decades now and about the Syrians just joined them uh, but also it's been already a decade um, well please share with us your observations um, in the field thank you Kemal the floor is yours okay thank you for the invitation I would just share my screen um, uh, oh, oh. okay so get on them uh, huh, okay <laughs> So hopefully it works. From my side, it works. So um, I hope it works also for yes, you. It so. does, it does, great, thank you. Okay. So first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to share some of the observation I did this last um, uh, seven years I spent in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, three years in Jordan, working mainly on the, um, on the Zaatari camp uh, and on the different uh, um, forms of settlement of, uh, of Syrian refugees. Uh, in Jordan, and then later on, four years uh, in uh, in Lebanon, working on different aspects of the uh, of the refugee crisis uh, in both uh, in both countries. So um, now I'm back in France, and I will just want to share with you some of the different uh, aspects uh, uh, and the role uh, of uh, of the different refugee movements and the political scene in the Middle East. Uh, 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 shaping uh, different migration policies. And I will take two examples, uh, Lebanon first, uh, as an example, and then, uh, and then also, uh, also Jordan to try to explain you or to try to give some elements to understand how these two countries have shaped and have constructed two different policy um, uh, uh, in relation with the, um, with the, uh, with the Syrian uh, crisis uh, since 2011. Um, well, first, I would just want to to uh, to share with you uh, a project. Um, and I'm 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 involved in, in IFPO, uh, the French Institute for the Near East, where I was before, uh, uh, is involved in a European research project uh, funded by the European Commission that is called Magic. And you have the uh, the link to the website. And I really recommend you to, if you don't know this project, to to connect. So there is a lot of information, a lot of different. Um, uh, uh, articles, papers, analysis on the different aspect of the uh, of the uh, of the current refugee uh, uh, crisis, uh, and related related to the different forms of governance in Europe, but also in the Middle East. And you have Turkish partners also uh, uh, working on this uh, on this issue. So I really highly recommend you to uh, to uh, to visit the website. And and there is a lot of information, up to date information uh, on the uh, on, on the refugee uh, um, uh, crisis, and and specifically on the on, on the Middle East, but not only. You have on Yemen. You have also on the Horn of Africa, and so on and so forth. Um, so today I will try to, 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 to first introduce you to this, um, uh, to this question of, 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 of refugees uh, in, in Lebanon and Syria, and then I will make 
a kind of historical perspective on 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 what uh, on on how on how Palestinian issue contribute to shape the current uh, uh, refugee response uh, in both countries, and then I will go to this response uh, and more specifically on the uh, on the Syrians. Uh, trying to understand attitudes of both countries and mainly going through the settlement process of uh, of the Syrian refugees uh, in um, in Lebanon and in Syria to highlight the different contexts and how uh, the response has been built as two different responses. So first of all, uh, a few a few contextual elements that I think are very crucial to understand the uh, the current refugee uh, current refugee crisis. First of all, these two countries are countries of emigration and immigration. Despite the crisis, despite refugee issue, you have large movements of emigration of Lebanese and Jordanians, mainly to the Gulf countries as uh, workers, but also uh, the very known and famous Lebanese diaspora all over the world. Uh, North America, Europe, and so on and so forth, uh, where uh, you find a lot of Lebanese emigrating uh, since uh, the uh, mid uh, 19th uh, century. So emigration is something crucial in both countries. You have ministries of emigration uh, uh, that exist in, in, both, uh, in both countries. And at the same time, you have in parallel, a lot of immigrants uh, uh, on, uh, on the labor market, coming from different countries, e even before 2011, coming from Syria, mainly uh, uh, for Lebanon, Egypt, uh, Asia, you have uh, Filipinas, you have uh, um, uh, Bangla uh, Bangladeshi, and coming from Africa also, Sudanese, Ethiopians, and so on and so forth. Uh, it is considered that between 20 and 40 percent of the uh, private uh, uh, Lebanese mar uh, work uh, labor market uh, is uh, uh, is occupied by by uh, by uh, by migrants. So it's huge numbers. Uh, it's not a very small proportion. It's a very very high proportion uh, working in different um, sectors uh, um, uh, such as. Um, uh, uh, for example, uh, construction sector, uh, um, uh, agriculture, of course, where you have a lot, a lot of of uh, of, uh, of immigrants. So, it's something that is crucial to understand how these countries will respond to a refugee crisis. Is that they already have a very, very large number of non-citizens on their uh, on uh, on their labor market. So this is the first element I wanted to highlight because it's something very important to understand because it's a completely different situation in, in other countries. If you take Egypt, if you take Tunisia, if you take European countries, it's a completely different situation and, in, and, and, and even Turkey, of course. The other uh, crucial element to have in mind is the, uh, uh, the mass displacement of refugees uh, in this region. Uh, the Syrian crisis is not a new phenomenon. Uh, the country, uh, uh, Lebanon and, and, and Jordan, have uh, 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 witnessed different uh, refugee uh, uh, crises since their independence after the World War II, more or less. And, uh, and these refugee movements are massive refugee movements. It's not limited in, to numbers and it's long lasting uh, periods. So you have, of course, the one that I will go back later on a little bit in more in, more in details, you, the Palestinian question, of course, since 1948, uh, you have uh, uh, around 750,000 uh, 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 Palestinian refugees who, who were forced to leave their country of residence in 1948. And now you have around five to six million uh, Palestinian refugees living in the different neighboring countries. And I will go back to the specificity of, uh, of this situation a little bit later. Uh, and of course, you have the 1967 uh, immigration uh, wave with the occupation by Israel of uh, all the Palestinian, historical Palestinian, uh, uh, the, the Palestinian uh, from the British mandate. 
And then later on, since the 90s, you have the very large movement of Iraqis uh, 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 concerning different waves of emigration from the, uh, the, the different Gulf Wars uh, and uh, after 1990. Uh, and then you have after 2003 and the fall of the Saddam Hussein regime, you have a huge emigration movements. Uh, and for example, Syria was one of the first countries to host after 2003 uh, uh, Syrian refugees. And then Syria became a country where refugees were leaving. So it's the whole process of, uh, of taking uh, uh, and settling refugee uh, groups, but also when the crisis and when the conflict arrives, these, the same countries can be by themselves, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, they produce new, uh, new refugee movements. And then after 2011, of course, the Syrian refugee movement, that is the biggest in number, the largest in number, of course. But also you have smallest groups that sometimes are forgotten. Uh, uh, and, and mostly uh, in, uh, in Jordan, you find uh, Yemenis, you find Sudanese, you find Somalis also uh, uh, that are uh, uh, settled uh, in, uh, in, uh, in these countries. Uh, and so it's interesting to have this, uh, this picture, uh, because if you take uh, the overall uh, proportion of refugees uh, in these countries, uh, I mean, in Lebanon, uh, you have around 20% of the overall population who is refugees, Syrian and Palestinians, of course. Uh, and I mean, in Jordan, you uh, might be something around eight to 10 percent if you take only the Syrians. But if you take the Palestinians, then it becomes uh, a, a completely different picture. But I will go back later on on the Palestinian question in Jordan because it's very specific. So it's very hard to give like numbers, but it's just have in mind that the proportion are extremely high compared to the overall uh, uh, national population. And this is a, a specificity. And the last point I wanted to introduce uh, into uh, this short uh, introduction is, um, um, well, sometimes it is considered that, uh, and spe specifically in, uh, in, the, um, in the way European Union is conceiving uh, these countries, they conceive these countries as transit countries towards, uh, towards uh, uh, Europe. Um, but this, I think this perception is, uh, uh, is, quite, is, quite, is quite wrong. It, it, it concerns only a very limited number of, uh, of refugees who transit through, uh, through the region to go to Europe. But most of them uh, settle uh, uh, in the neighboring countries. They settle in Lebanon, they settle in Iraq, they settle in Jordan. And the overall refugee population Syrians or Palestinians are still living uh, uh, in uh, and settled uh, for uh, a long period of time uh, uh, in the Middle Eastern countries, and only a very, very limited number of them uh, emigrate uh, uh, towards uh, uh, European countries or toward the uh, third, third, uh, third countries. So I think it's not a question of looking only at, at, at migration trajectories uh, uh, um, uh, towards uh, external uh, 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 regions uh, uh, of the Middle East, but it's much more to understand how these people settle uh, in, in, uh, in, in Jordan or Lebanon. It's much more important to understand this uh, than to understand only uh, the, uh, the idea that they just settle temporarily uh, in these countries to go, to go further. Uh, to go uh, uh, in European countries. So I, I personally, I, I focus much more on, 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 on settlement processes, and I will just introduce you to these different dimensions uh, um, uh, during this presentation. And, and, for the last, uh, and for the last point, precarious uh, legal context, I wanted to give a little bit more details because maybe uh, you're not on, on, all very familiar with this. Uh, and I wanted just to go a little bit further and to, uh, and to go to the specific uh, legal context. Well, uh, um, there is something that is a kind of paradox. We are in the region where uh, the refugees uh, 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 represent, as I told you, a very, very large proportion of the, uh, of, uh, of the population. And it's a very, very old phenomenon. So it's more than 75 years old, if we consider the uh, Palestinian uh, question. And these two countries are not signatories of the 1951 Geneva Convention on, refugee, uh, uh, on, uh, on Refugees. It means uh, that there is no legal 
asylum process uh, in these two countries. Uh, there is not, nothing called an asylum procedure. It does not exist at the level of the state. Uh, so this is quite, quite interesting uh, uh, to know that how these two countries will, will deal with huge number of refugees when they don't have any proper asylum system in their, uh, uh, in their, uh, in their laws. So what is, is currently happening on the ground is that you have two United Nations agencies operating. And this is also a quite interesting uh, uh, phenomenon because it's one of the only countries in the world where you have another institution that is not the UNHCR dealing with the uh, refugee issue. So of course you have the UNHCR that is uh, quite common and it operates since the 90s more or less since the uh, uh, Iraqi crisis, uh, uh, UNHCR opened offices uh, uh, in Lebanon and in, uh, and in Jordan uh, to operate. And gradually uh, it has put in place some kind of asylum, asylum procedure that are done by the UNHCR agencies in collaboration with the, uh, uh, with the local government and with the local authorities. But it's UNHCR who, is going through the process of giving or not uh, asylum and not the, uh, the, uh, the local authorities. And you have another uh, institution uh, that is quite interesting. It's, it's UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Work Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, dealing only with the Palestinian refugees. So Palestinian refugees are not covered by the mandate of UNHCR. UNRWA was created before, uh, UNHCR was created, so it was created in 1949. And so the Palestinians have a specific legal uh, 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 status in these two countries. So it's quite interesting to see. We can go much more in detail if you want during the question, because it would be too long to explain you uh, uh, the role of UNRWA in this country, but you have two different, uh, uh, two different agencies dealing with two different groups of refugees, and they don't have the same mandate. They don't cover the same uh, field. And for example, UNRWA is much more oriented towards assistance, and UNHCR is much more oriented toward assistance plus protection. And UNRWA is less uh, involved in protection. It doesn't have the mean really, really to protect uh, uh, the, uh, the Palestinian refugees, as you may have seen and witnessed in the different uh, uh, conflicts uh, in, um, in the Middle East. And then uh, what is interesting is that these two countries have signed uh, MOUs, Memorandum of, of Understanding. It means like kind of agreements with the UNHCR to know how this UN agency will act in these two uh, in in these two countries, and what is interesting is that it's not very clear. These MOUs are not very clear, uh, and they are always on the way to be rediscussed in order to adapt to the different crises. So it's much more a kind of ad hoc MOU uh, than. Um, the shaping of a real asylum uh, policy on the long term. <clears throat> and I will just give you an example. I think it's very interesting to have, uh, to have this example in mind. Uh, the example concerns uh, concerned, uh, Lebanon. Uh, if you read uh, 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 this slide, uh, it's, it's, it's very clear. It's very clear and, um, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, the way Lebanese authorities when they signed this MOU uh, uh, at the beginning of 2000 after the uh, during the Iraqi crisis uh, it clearly states that Lebanon does not consider itself as an asylum country due to several social economic and demographic consideration and with the Palestinian uh, a refugee question also so it means that from the Lebanese perception, an asylum seeker is someone who is a person seeking asylum in a country other than Lebanon. So Lebanon clearly states in this MOU, even if this MOU is discussed uh, currently since, since a few years, but there is no real result uh, in it. It means that Lebanon does not consider itself as a country to host 
asylum seekers or refugees on the long term. And this is another part of the contradiction. As I told you, it's one of the countries in the world where the proportion of refugee is the highest regarding the uh, national population, but also still, it's a country that does not consider that the person residing on its territory are refugees. Uh, so it's a kind of interesting uh, perception. Uh, uh, and, um, and I think that it's, it, it's quite interesting to see how big is how big is the difference between the reality of hosting on the long term uh, 100,000 of refugees and not having any kind of asylum system that will deal with this very large population. So this is uh, 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 the very, the, the very specific context uh, of uh, of uh, of Jordan and Lebanon. And Jordan, more or less, doesn't have exactly the same kind of MOU. But more or less, Jordan does not really recognize that refugees will stay on the long term of it on on its territory. It's much more considering people as asylum seekers that have two options. Uh, the the first option is to is to go is to return to their country of origin, uh, meaning for currently it's, uh, it's, it's Syria, and on the other side uh, uh, to re-emigrate uh, or to be resettled in, uh, in third countries. So that's mostly the two options that these two countries uh, have in mind when talking about refugee situation. And it's a completely, and I will, and you, and I will go to the uh, to, to the second part to show you the process of settlement of these of the of the Palestinians and of the Syrians, and you will clearly see that there is a big contradiction between this policy uh, that are designed by the uh, national authorities and the reality in terms of protracted settlement of refugees on their territory. So if we go now to the uh, Palestinian refugees, um, um, it's mostly uh, uh, what we could call a counter model for this, uh, for Lebanon and for Jordan. What they did uh, 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 with, the, uh, with, with the Palestinians and what happened later on with the settlement on the long term of the Palestinians is for these two countries, the uh, experience that needs to be put as far as possible I mean, they don't want to reproduce and to recreate a second Palestinian, uh, 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 a second Palestinian group on their earth. I mean, they, meaning that they don't want that the Syrians will experience, will have the same experience that uh, that the Syrians. As you may see on these different maps, on these two maps, uh, 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 it's in '58. It was more or less when the Palestinian uh, from '48 settled, uh, uh, and from uh, more or less uh, today. You can see that you have more than 50 uh, refugee camps uh, in, uh, in the Middle East and that they are growing and they didn't, I mean, disappear. So what was created as temporary uh, refugee camps, and as you mentioned, Chatila, and I will show you some, 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 some picture of Chatila. Uh, uh, um, when you look at it, uh, uh, it's, a, I mean, camps have been transformed into cities and they are more or less permanently settled. Uh, and so they are realities. They are urban realities of the Middle East. You have more than 50 uh, uh, refugee, Palestinian refugee camps in the region, and they have completely transformed uh, uh, most of the uh, 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 urban landscape uh, of, uh, of the big cities uh, in the Middle East. I mean, you cannot imagine a man without Palestinian refugee camp. You can hardly imagine uh, um, uh, Beirut without uh, at least the southern suburbs of Beirut without, without Palestinian refugee camp and so on and so forth. So more or less, uh, this is, is a picture, this picture I took uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Shatila refugee camp. So you can see what is a refugee camp today, 75 years later after its creation. It's urban setting. It's extremely dense because the size of the camp didn't uh, didn't uh, 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 change, but the population, of course, uh, uh, grew a lot. So it's informally, it's 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 informal, 
uh, as you may see, it's uh, it's it's uh, the building, the the quality of the building is extremely bad because they don't have money. It's pockets of poverty, it's pockets of insecurity, of course, uh, and there is a very limited uh, um, um, possibilities for the local authorities in Lebanon to access the refugee camp, especially in terms of security, but it's also in terms of infrastructure, uh, water, electricity, and so on and so forth is extremely bad in this. Uh, in this location. So one has to have in mind that when the Lebanese authorities or when the Jordanian authorities were looking at the uh, Syrian refugee crisis, uh, they have in mind that maybe the settlement places, the settlement, whether it is camp or not camps, official or non-official camps, might transform into uh, 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 10 years, 15 years, uh, 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 20 years later, they have this model of Shatila and of the different refugee camp. And they think that maybe if they don't have a proper policy, then the current Syrian refugee uh, uh, settlement will transform into a different uh, 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 Palestinian refugee camp uh, situation. So this is the way they perceive and they conceive uh, the um, uh, the, uh, this, the current Syrian refugee crisis. If you can see in different if we go a little bit away from the big cities, we go away from Beirut, we are now in Tyre in South Lebanon. It's a refugee camp where I worked during a, a, a long time. And you can see also that there are huge transformation and, and, and what was very small rural camps are now becoming also uh, uh, urban, urban settings. And this is a concern for, uh, for, the, uh, for the Lebanese authorities. And uh, even if you don't look at official camps, Shatila and Albas, the two camps I showed you, are official camps that are uh, uh, um, uh, under the responsibility of the United Nations of the UNRWA. Uh, uh, you have also informal settlements, and, and and this is a small settlement close to Tyre region. It's a it's a rural settlement, and at the very beginning, it was a very very small uh, informal settlement, and. 70 years later, uh, it's becoming like a small village uh, uh, built up, uh, of course, with a very poor quality of, uh, of, uh, of infrastructure and, and so on and so forth. But even if it's not an official camp, these informal gatherings, or what we could call informal camps today, uh, if we look at the Syrian situation, uh, can even be become uh, decades after uh, uh, permanent settlements. So whether it is camps or non-camp policy, uh, it does not uh, um, uh, have an impact on the, uh, on, on, on the way it will evolve uh, uh, during, uh, 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 during uh, the following years after the, uh, after the uh, exile. So this is the context, this is the way the policy they have developed regarding and towards uh, uh, Palestinian refugees and the way it has shaped today uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Syrian uh, response to the uh, current Syrian crisis. So now if we move to the, uh, to, to the second part, uh, the current Syrian refugee crisis in Jordan and Lebanon, so you have the context, you have the way these two countries have, have seen and have developed uh, their own their own policy. What is interesting to have in mind is first, we cannot understand the current Syrian refugee crisis if we don't understand what I told you at the very beginning of this presentation is that Syrians were before being refugees, they were migrants. Uh, more or less before 2011, we consider that there was around 400,000 Syrian workers in Lebanon. So nearly half a million. So it's extremely big number in relation to the population of Lebanon that is 4.5 million, 5 million, more or less. So we have a large proportion of the labor market that was taken by the Syrian migrants before they became refugees. After 2011, a part of these workers became refugees and other came. In Jordan, it's a little bit different, but the northern part of, of Jordan, 
uh, witnessed also the presence of um, thousands, maybe a little bit more, uh, of, uh, of Syrian workers before the crisis. So these refugee movements are the uh, uh, are following uh, migration movements, and so there is a kind of um, of of historical links that have been developed between uh, both countries that are shaping uh, the uh, the refugee crisis. So connection between refugees and migrants is extremely important to understand the geographical distribution of uh, of, of 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 refugees uh, uh, today. And probably it's one of the explanation why, uh, despite the very, very large number of, uh, of, of Syrian refugees uh, uh, in Lebanon, for example, nearly 1 million for a population, as I told you, of 4.5 million, um, uh, it's the way that they were already integrated in the labor market. A large proportion of them were, was already integrated in the labor market. So the transformation is much more in terms of these migrants were going back and forth from Lebanon to Syria before 2011, but with the crisis and with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the change in the Syrian situation with the conflict, these refugees settled more or less permanently uh, in, uh, in Lebanon, and they brought a new population that was, was not very uh, important before, the kids. Uh, uh, so the whole families came and settled. You have uh, um, women before, I mean, uh, they were working mostly in the agricultural sector. Men were working more in the construction sector, for example, but they were going back and forth. But then it transformed into a, a kind of permanent uh, settlement. And then the challenge for the Lebanese was how to uh, integrate all the kids, for example, in schools. Uh, and the transformation was uh, uh, regarding public infrastructure, such, such as hospitals, for example. So it's it's a completely different perspective, but it's a transformation from a temporary migration system and migration uh, 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 trends towards a permanent, more important refugee crisis and uh, a different uh, kind of population that we're concerned, and especially uh, the large, extremely large number of kids, uh, uh, of course, uh, in this um, in uh, in Lebanon. So, the two countries adopted two different policies. At the very beginning, both countries have a completely open door policy. So, all the Syrians, more or less, uh, were allowed to enter and settle on the territory. And then gradually, with a change into the Syrian conflict and with the uh, raise of the uh, Islamist movement, such as uh, 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 Daesh, uh, there was a transformation in terms of risks. And then beginning of 2014, 2015, these two countries be uh, began to close their border to the arrival of new refugees, but with two different trends. Lebanon, with the uh, uh, having in mind this uh, this Palestinians experience, they refused to open camps. So there was a kind of uh, of settlement of uh, of refugees all over the country, in small settlements, urban and rural settlements. And in Jordan, there was a different uh, uh, there was a different approach. Uh, in mid two thousand twelve, uh, Jordan has decided to open refugee camps. Why? It was not for humanitarian purpose. I mean, as such. But the idea behind uh, uh, was that uh, uh, Jordan was in need of assistance because the number of refugees was becoming very, very large. But the international community didn't give so much assistance to Jordan. So Jordan decided, in cooperation with UNHCR, to open camps uh, uh, in order to uh, have a kind of, um, of, of, of setting uh, that would give to the international community uh, uh, that when you open a refugee camp, it means that you are in need of assistance because urban refugees, you don't see them really. They are scattered all around the territory and it's very hard to, um, to, to give it, I mean, it's a kind of visibility. Uh, Jordan has, while Lebanon was trying to hide because of internal political problems, because half of Lebanon is 
of their political scene is pro-Syrian regime and half is anti-Syrian regime. It was not the case in Jordan. Jordan was completely uh, uh, against more or less uh, the, uh, the, the, the Syrian uh, regime. Uh, and so uh, they decided to put into visibility the, the refugee question to bring money from and to bring assistance from, uh, from, uh, from other countries. So two different policies, two different policies with two different results. Uh, if we look at how policy change uh, affected uh, trajectories, so this is the work that I did with, uh, with, uh, with, with another French researcher, David Lagarde, who, 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 who drove the map. If you look at the first map, uh, Alaa's uh, journey, uh, it was when the border was, uh, was opened. So people could have more or less direct uh, uh, um, uh, uh, trajectory. It was quite easy to cross uh, uh, from Syria to Jordan. And they were going through the uh, Zaatari camp, who was a camp to uh, a kind of transit camp. And then the people can go outside and, and, and settle in different cities uh, in, uh, in Jordan. But if, if you look at the second map uh, on the right, you can see that since the complete close of the border, there was only one border that was opened, uh, on the eastern part of, uh, of, uh, of Syria, it's in the middle of the desert, um, you can see that it was much more difficult uh, for, uh, for refugees to enter the Jordanian territory. And so it became extremely hard with very, very long journeys, very risked journeys for, uh, for, uh, for, for, for Syrian refugees. So uh, this is uh, a, a way to explain you how the development of camps uh, in, in, in Jordan, in parallel with the closure of the border, had important impacts on, uh, on, uh, on, on, refugees, uh, on refugees' trajectories. It was never the case in Lebanon. In Lebanon, the border was closed, but on, always opened with... with the, I mean, they didn't really close the border, as Jordan put, but they opened like uh, a visa procedure. And then Syrians who were entering before uh, only with their IDs uh, uh, in, uh, in Lebanon had to uh, have a passport and had to have a visa and then they can enter. But it was never the same. So when you open camps, when you don't open camps, when you close the border or, or when you only put restriction on, on border, then it has an important impact on, on the, on the uh, refugees' trajectories. Then, in terms of settlement, uh, 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 this is the, uh, um, the, the other aspect, but I will not be very long because I, I spoke, uh, uh, at least, uh, I think, uh, too much. Um, uh, for, the, uh, for the Lebanon uh, case, you can see that there was not any kind of, of camp was opened. And you can see that on the map, after 2014, 2015, the number of new entries decreased. So more or less after 2014, you have a picture of, I mean, the, the demographic picture of the, uh, of the uh, Syrian refugees uh, in Lebanon. It's what we could say that all the Lebanese territory was concerned uh, by Syrian settlement. It was, it's a very small settlement in urban areas, in rural areas, in all the rural areas, it's small informal camps that can be transformed into what I showed you with the Palestinian ones. And in the other, it's settlement in urban areas. And most of them settle in Shatila-like uh, uh, neighborhoods. Uh, a lot of Palestinian refugee camps have been transformed and hosting uh, uh, Syrian refugees today. Uh, uh, but it's also in poor neighborhoods all over the country. So there is not a single place in Lebanon that is not concerned by the settlement of Syrian refugees. And this is a very interesting uh, element to have in mind. But if you look now at the Jordanian case, it's a completely different picture. You can see that it's much more restricted to the northern part, to the northwest part of Jordan. It's because urban areas are located in these places uh, in Jordan, but also they are concentrated into very big refugee camps. Uh, Zaatari camp, uh, is now around 75,000 uh, inhabitants, so it's like a city. And I will show you some picture of, um, of the uh, Zaatari camp. Um, 
and the others are located in the uh, in, uh, in in the in, in the main uh, cities of uh, of northern jordan so you can see that the 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 impact of the policy uh, has a completely different uh, result in the two different countries in jordan it's much more concentrated in some in some specific areas whether it is in 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 refugee camps whether it is in the big northern cities of the countries uh, and, and of course, you can see that the uh, the border area is uh, is uh, is uh, plays an important role in the accommodation and in the settlement of uh, of the refugees. And this is partly linked to the fact that some of the refugees were uh, going back and forth before 2011, working in these places because there was a kind of link between southern Syria. And, uh, and northern Jordan uh, across uh, cross border migration was existing before uh, before 2011. And if we look at uh, um, at the camp, uh, uh, so this is I think a very interesting uh, process, uh, and this is will be my my kind of conclusion uh, on the, on on Zaatari camp. Uh, you can you can see how it has developed. So it was a very small setting supposed to be temporary and now it's uh, nine years old it has been created in july 2012 and it has gradually uh, gradually uh, uh, grown from a small settlement to a very big settlement so uh, uh and zaltari camp plays uh, two roles it's a settlement for refugees kind of permanent settlement for like i told you uh, 75,000 uh, refugees today. It has grown more than 150,000 at the period of time, but some people left the camp. And then uh, 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 it's also a transit camp. Most uh, of the refugees who are currently settled uh, in Jordan uh, transited uh, through, uh, through the camp to be registered uh, uh, for security reasons, of course. And then some of them, if they manage to have what is called in Arabic a kafil, that is called a, sp a sponsor. So they are allowed, if they have a Jordanian sponsor, they are allowed to get out of the camp and to settle into uh, uh, Jordanian territory. And then uh, they will can find employment, you maybe have the idea of the compacts that have been signed in 2016 uh, in Lebanon and in Jordan. It's kind of agreement uh, uh, with the European Union, uh, mostly, uh, uh, trying to develop the, um, the local integration of, uh, of the Syrian refugees in, in both countries. Jordan has, has opened them uh, the right to work for a limited number of them. Uh, and some of them uh, 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 acquired the work permit and were able to work legally in the country. In Lebanon, it's a little bit different. It's much more difficult to access the legal labor market, but most of them work on the informal labor market, of course. Uh, then this is um, 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 the last picture I want to uh, I want to to conclude on it, and, and of course we can de develop different aspects during the discussion. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this is Zaatari camp. So Zaatari camp is a mix of um, of what you can see uh, uh, as uh, the first picture is um, is uh, what they call the uh, uh, Champs Elysees because there was a, a French uh, uh, a French um, a hospital who opened uh, uh, that will, had been opened in, in this. Uh, in this uh, in this street, and then it become um, uh, a commercial. Uh, the refugees by themselves transformed uh, uh, um, housing into a commercial area. And so you can find different things. You can find small restaurants. You can find groceries. You can find hairdresser. You can find uh, so on and so forth. Different things that are brought from outside of the camp and sold inside the camp. And it's a kind of reproducing uh, uh, a city. Uh, with the commercial uh, area where people can also socialize uh, because it's it's a place that is disconnected from uh, from the urban area uh, and then you can see the tents that now are hardly existing this picture was taken uh, like in 2014 2015 i think uh, and now it's hardly exists and you can see that uh, the two last pictures at um, what it, the camp is now looking uh, uh, like so it's um, uh, kind of temporary uh, uh, housing structures. Uh, uh, refugees are not allowed to build uh, uh, with, uh, with cement or with stones, anything. It has to be temporary. 
they are not allowed to have like permanent structures in order to avoid uh, if you have in, if you still have in mind the pictures of the Palestinian camps Jordan wanted to avoid any kind of of reproducing a new Palestinian issue so they wanted the, to keep the camp as temporary as they can in terms of infrastructure in order to be able to remove the camp uh, if they want to uh, return uh, uh, the uh, Syrian refugees uh, uh, in Syria. Of course, today, the question of return is not on the agenda because war didn't, is not finished, as you, as you all know, uh, in, in, in Syria. And most of the refugees, even if they want to return one day, uh, uh, today, security and the political situation does not allow, of course, uh, uh, refugees to go back to uh, their country of origin. So we are always in the Middle East, uh, in Jordan and Lebanon, in between trying to keep the refugee question as temporary as possible. This is from the point of view of the authorities uh, and to keep it on a very um, precarious legal context, meaning a very precarious form of settlement and even if you look at Shatila, it's still extremely informal. It's not like uh, there is no real infrastructure. And on the other side, uh, the what we can all witness uh, and see is the kind of 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 permanent uh, uh, settlement uh, that is uh, occurring. But it's the reality with the Palestinian question because the, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict is absolutely not solved, of course. But also for the Syrians, it's exactly the same thing. We, 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 we can witness a move toward a form of permanent settlement or long-term at least settlement in their country of, uh, of, uh, of asylum. Whereas the legal context and the policy, reception policy of the two countries is still extremely temporary and uh, and uh, precarious. I want to thank you. Um, I hope I have been have not been too long. Uh, no, no, thank you, Kemal. That was uh, great uh, because you know we've been talking about what's going on in Turkey and what has changed since two thousand eleven. Uh, but of course, we tend to forget what's happening in other countries, right? So other than Turkey, Jordan and Lebanon, for example, host a very large number of refugees. You mentioned Palestinians, of course, but then there are Syrians. Uh, you know, these are added numbers. And as you mentioned also, uh, the large number of Syrians, uh, I mean, most of the refugees, let's say, um, not Syrians, but all refugees in the world, they don't live in Europe or in the uh, North America but they live in the neighboring countries uh, and, you know, and especially the Middle East, right? Uh, the bed of conflict in a, in a way. So as again, in, as you mentioned in your speech, it's uh, this uh, refugee issue, uh, as you gave examples from the Palestinians and Syrians, it's become a protracted and precari pre precarious situation, uh, right? So it means lots of danger, uh, lots of... in. Uh, you know, unknown uh, or uncertainties uh, for refugees themselves, but also deepening poverty. Deepening poverty. Uh, so again, another thing that you mentioned, the second thing that uh, you underlined is that their transit situation, other than their protracted and precarious situation, they are stranded uh, transit situation. Like in a way, they become in a way stranded refugees, right? Uh, so because okay, most of them, if you ask them, you know, um, you know, where do you want to go? Uh, they probably mention uh, Europe or some other place, uh, but they are in fact stranded there. Um, so. Uh, the you know the we also see that most of them are urban refugees. Uh, even the Zatara camp, I don't have the possibility, unfortunately, I couldn't get permission when I was in Jordan. Uh, you showed us beautiful pictures, but also you showed us uh, how uh, problematic the whole uh, Zatari camp is. Right, it's a makeshift uh, thing and uh, um, very. Um, how can I say? Uh, so it's temporary. I mean, the message by the government, you know, is that it is temporary. You're not supposed to be here yet. They're, they've been there for oh, almost 10 years now. 
Uh, but another thing is uh, when you say that these are urban refugees, uh, of course, it also places a big burden on the education, on the whole societies, uh, on education, on healthcare, uh, etc. So they come also for for the uh, from the perspective of host societies from an open door policy. Uh, they become uh, you know it becomes a most in a way, alienation, right, at the moment, and even forced returns, I think, in Lebanon's case, um, you know, forced return of Syrians to, um, to the homeland. Um, my question is, uh, that was very interesting, again, thank you. Uh, you know, because you showed us the macro perspectives how this policy making, uh, you know, the existence of UNHCR, but also the existence of uh, UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Works Agency. It's also a, an interesting uh, understanding of asylum, uh, you know, because of no asylum, etc. cetera. But um, uh, one interest, one question comes to mind, you know, if we compare the Turkish cases, the language issue, because here, uh, I mean, we can say whether we like it or not, Turkey has started uh, integration policies. Um, again, uh, it's a protracted issue, but are there any um, uh, social integration policies in Lebanon and Jordan? That's one question. And of course, um, um, you know, one thing that comes when we talk about social integration is the language issue. Because in Turkey, we say, oh, because they don't speak uh, Turkish well enough and they cannot really integrate. Uh, so they cannot find uh, good um, jobs uh, or at least in the formal economy. So, uh, or education, so, etc. But, you know, in La Jordan and Lebanon, they speak uh, the same language, right? In, in mm -hmm. fact, they have very much ethnic uh, uh, but also uh, relationships actually um, across the border. So how does this impact their uh, position in Jordan and Lebanon? And maybe uh, another question, second question is if you can talk about a little bit on gender, uh, you know, um, what is the position, what is the situation of women uh, living uh, in, in, in Jordan in, in those camps, let's say? Thank you. Well, thanks for the questions. And um, well, in terms of uh, of social integration, um, we have um, a very um, we have two different um, uh, two different um, situ two different situations in in Jordan and and in Lebanon. Well, the first element is that if we took it if we took Lebanon first, um, um, the, the 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 big problem in Lebanon is the relation between. Uh, Lebanon and Syria as a whole. Uh, historically, these two countries have been connected and extremely connected. Uh, so uh, uh, it, it's something that is historically important to have. I mean, we, we, we cannot imagine one country without the other. I mean, it's, it's extremely dense relation between the two countries. Um, but you have other problems in, in Lebanon that are mostly historical and, and political problems. Um, uh, for a large number of Lebanese, uh, they have the perception that, uh, 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 and it was a reality, that Syria was occupying during 30 years the country. So there was a military occupation that was quite brutal. Uh, everyone can understand that what, how, what does it mean to be uh, uh, militarily occupied by another country, uh, specifically uh, with the Syrian regime. Uh, so um, uh, a large number of people cannot accept any kind of integration uh, of Syrians uh, in relation to the fear that it would lead uh, to another form of occupation. Of course, there is no relation between the military occupation and the refugees that are currently arriving. They are not responsible of what happened before and they are not, it's not an army, but there is this perception that uh, historically uh, uh, it could be uh, something extremely dangerous uh, for Lebanon. 
And, and, and the second element is that, as you may, uh, of course, know, but I don't know if the students and uh, 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 everybody knows exactly how it works, but Lebanon is built on sectarian balance. The political system in Lebanon is based on sectarian balance. Uh, and the fact that vast majority of the Syrian refugees are Sunni Muslims uh, 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 is something that is considered by part of the uh, uh, Lebanese political parties to uh, be a threat towards this uh, sectarian balance and that any form of integration on the long term would lead to a much more complicated problem into, uh, in terms of, uh, of sectarian balance. And the last point for Lebanon in terms of social integration is that if they open the door to the integration of one group of refugees, then it will immediately lead to the question of what about the Palestinians? And of course, with the Palestinian historical also problem uh, uh, that uh, during the civil war and so on uh, and so on and so forth, it would lead to another problem that is a sectarian problems. Palestinians are also uh, 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 in majority Sunni Muslims, but also to uh, a political question of how can we integrate on the long term uh, um, uh, refugee groups that would completely change the nature of the society. We have to have in mind that even if we can disagree with this argument, that can be something that we can, I would just uh, uh, um, uh, uh, analyzing the way people are perceiving it. Uh, um, uh, but we have to have in mind that it's it's like 20% of the population. We are talking about 20% of the population. It's not like a very small numbers. It's extremely large number for a, for a, for a, for a country. In Jordan, it's a little bit difficult. It's a little bit different uh, because uh, the proportion of refugees is is, is, is much more low, uh, and there is no sectarian question in. in in Jordan, it's not. I mean, the, the 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 country is not based on sectarian balance, and so there is no link between uh, uh, refugees and sectarian balance. The other th the only thing is, it's much more related to the um, nation building process in Jordan. Uh, there was a kind of very problematic at the very beginning of uh, uh, of nation building in uh, in Jordan in order to acquire a kind of legitimacy. Uh, of uh, of the Jordanian citizenship, Jordanian citizenship is is based on um, historically on this um, of um, uh, connecting and integrating different groups uh, in 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 the same country uh, uh, and and creating a Jordanian identity uh, that is a, a, a kind of mix of um, of these different of these different groups with like we can say that maybe something like half of the population is from Palestinian origin, more or less. Um, so it was a very difficult process for the Jordanians uh, to, um, I mean, Jordan, for example, until now, uh, the Palestinians, Palestinian refugees, hold for the vast majority the Jordanian nationality, citizenship, and at the same time, they are registered as refugees. So they are both refugees and citizens. It is quite something that it does not exist in other countries. So Jordan had this difficulty to manage, and so um, the, it's much more related to the nation building and to the difficulty of Jordan to, to transform. So they had this, uh, at the beginning of 2000s, they have this, um, uh, this political uh, slogan that was uh, Jordan first. Uh, so this, the idea was try to build a national identity uh, uh, and some of the people uh, understood it as trans-Jordanian first, so excluding Palestinians and others, and others says no, it's to try to recreate a national identity. So this is, uh, uh, in terms of integration, I, I think that in Jordan, it's something that can be a process, and even the Jordanian compact has been much more effective in terms of integration in the labor market for, uh, for the Syrians than it was in, in Lebanon. And maybe it's two different trends and two different contexts. But, uh, and of course the language is, is, is not a problem and, and so on and so forth, even for the education process and so on. But uh, there is, uh, concerning uh, the second question on, uh, on gender. As I, as I, as I mentioned uh, in my presentation, uh, in Lebanon, 
there was a large number of women working in the labor market before 2011. Uh, not permanently, when they were working in the agricultural sector, going back and forth, and a lot of marriages between uh, Lebanese and, uh, and Syrian citizens uh, before 2011. So it was mostly a change into a form of back and forth movement of circulation uh, and transform into a much more permanent settlement of these uh, refugee groups uh, in Lebanon. So, I mean, it does not really change uh, the, uh, the situation, despite the fact that it was quite difficult uh, uh, to, to uh, for the, 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 the most important thing in Lebanon was the housing situation. Uh, before you can have different men's working, uh, living together in a small apartment, and now they have to manage with families, kids, wife, and so on. So it becomes a much more complicated process, but it's, it's not uh, like a big difference. But in Jordan, it's a completely different. Uh, it's completely different, especially if we look at the camps, because most of the population living in camps that are now city-like situations, they were uh, from, uh, from very small villages. So uh, it's not only to change the country, it's not only to become a refugee, but it's also uh, a way of um, transforming rural life to urban life. So there was this very big change. And one of the things that have been witnessed uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Zaatari camp, and was quite interesting, is that some women acquired a new status, a new kind of freedom that they didn't have before because they come from Southern Syria, that is a very conservative uh, uh, um, place. And they were coming from rural backgrounds, so more or less isolated places, small villages, farms, and so on. And they arrived in a place where they are in a city. So where they could develop an urban way of life, more, I mean, it's not, <laughs> I'm, I'm not like uh, 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 saying that it's a real city and so on, but I mean, they have completely transformed. So their social and special practices evolved a lot and they acquired a kind of, uh, of, of new possibilities opened in terms of uh, uh, access to some services, uh, access to other kind of, uh, of uh, social life. That have been transformed. So it's quite interesting. And we could even witness it, uh, even if it's not, um, I didn't study it as such, but it was something that upon discussions into the camp, that was interesting in terms of marriage. It have changed the way uh, marriage was organized. Uh, uh, so uh, women and even men acquired new possibilities of uh, marrying uh, outside the local community and to integrate it in a broader. Uh, so it's interesting to see that things have changed uh, for women uh, 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 in Jordan. So that was quite interesting to see that even in camps, you can find some new forms of social life that are created uh, uh, in... Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Um... Okay, any questions from the audience, from our uh, graduate students and uh, instruct uh, lecturers? <laughs> uh, okay, I can't see any hands actually coming up. That means you're all very clear, uh, Kimberl. <laughs> Uh, well, I checked out uh, the uh, website in the meantime. Uh, what is it? Ma Ma Maxi? Uh, magic. Yes. magic, yes. And uh, uh, so Hugo Observatory is there. And, uh, you know, one uh, academic from Ankara is also there, Bashak. Mm -hmm. And you're also coordinating this, um, one of the research teams is Sabanja University, and Meltem is there, so mm -hmm. I'm uh, pleased to see. Uh, that's, uh, that will be interesting, actually, the result of that uh, research, actually, I'll, I'll be, we'll be eager to read in the, in the near future. Good. <laughs> Have you published in, in English or in French on this uh, comparative situation? 
uh, it's it's ongoing publicate. Uh, I, I mean, it's, we we I have three articles, two on Jordan, uh, two chapters, and 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 one on Lebanon uh, that will be published in English. Uh, they are on the process of being published, but everything will be advertised on the different website, whether it is Magic or Ifpo website. I see. Uh, it will be uh, it will be uh, published, and we will uh, put online. I think um, during spring. Um, yeah, we're working on it on in Jordan and in Lebanon. We are uh, trying to produce a timeline of uh, the different uh, policy evolution uh, of the two countries. So okay. uh, trying to uh, connect uh, 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 change in, uh, in 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 policies with different actors, state actors, municipalities, international actors, and so on and so forth, um, uh, security agencies and so on, uh, uh, and, and, and how they have uh, shaped the uh, overall, as I told you, there is no asylum policy. So we tried to look at the different actors that are de facto shaping the asylum policy. Yeah. So we will publish online um, uh, a timeline that will be uh, hopefully both in English and Arabic, because most of the documents are uh, are in Arabic. But we'll try to uh, to uh, to to translate it as far as we can. And I think it's very interesting because if we look at the Lebanese context, we can see that at the very beginning uh, of the crisis there was no real policy. Nothing was it was like an open door policy without any kind of uh, producing laws, decrees, and so on. And gradually, with uh, the settlement of the uh, refugees, there was all the different actors from municipalities to uh, uh, to ministries to uh, 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 government and uh, uh, and uh, and many many different kind of things have been taken. And so we can see how. The policy is constructed not by um, a centralized actor that would be the government, such as it's the case in, in Jordan, for example, where you have the government that is shaping the policy, and maybe in Turkey it's the same. You have a government that is shaping a policy. But in, uh, uh, in Lebanon, it's quite interesting to see all this diversity of actors that are de facto shaping what is becoming an asylum policy without having like a big asylum policy so yeah but that's not surprising since there is uh no <laughs> a government in lebanon <laughs> mm -hmm. right so that lots of i mean what i mean is lots of political problems right so uh interesting and also of course the uh the what lebanon's what lebanon was doing was also but also jordan to a certain extent uh to get more international funding uh, as much as possible right and uh, that's why they make it um, the, 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 as problematic as possible uh, mm -hmm. for the international donors. I mean, at least that's my observation two years ago. Uh, thank you, Kamal, for your time. If there are any no uh, urgent questions, uh, we have to stop here. Thank you again uh, for this wonderful presentation um, and uh, hope to see you soon, uh, maybe in Turkey. Thanks for the invitation. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.